Well, most of us who stand up and speak before people and who are likely, hopefully, going to listen, um, we think about our initial introduction, um, our initial greeting. It likely sets the tone of what's to come, and many of us, many of you, get interested or not, depending upon that um, beginning, that, that initial time, that initial greeting. It's also true of blog posts, letters, and books. The writers know you've got to interest your audience quickly, or what will happen? Nine night, or on I go, somewhere else, if you're on the internet, you're going to move on, and we, the writers, the speakers, will have lost you. Most of the New Testament letters begin somewhat triumphantly, majestically even, to remind the church, here's who you are, here's what you've got, this is great news. It's like the gospel or something, right? Great news. So as a way of beginning today, I want to revisit Brother James' happy hello to the readers of his letter, his fellow Jewish believers. So let's begin reading. You'll see it on the screen from James chapter 1. You've been there before, but we're going to revisit it. James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. How does that make you feel? Isn't that great? Greetings. It's like he's saying, hey, yo, what up, whatevs. It's so perfunctory, but that's what we get from James, and then he launches into this thing about, yeah, I know it's bad. It's just so quick. And what would you, the reader, think at that moment? Greetings. I can tell you what I would think. In comparison with all of the other New Testament letters, I know what I think when I first read it. Uh, um, that's different. Uh-oh. I wonder if I'm in trouble. Consider the book of Ephesians. We just completed a series about a month ago through that book. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. This is just common of most of the New Testament letters. Verse 1 from Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, meaning you, you have everything in Christ. You'll always receive everything in Christ. You'll never have to wonder about having everything in Christ because it's already done. You get it all for nothing. You just believe you're in. You got it all. And peace. God has given you peace. He's created peace. It's a gift to you. You have peace with God. You'll never lose it. You may think you have. You may feel like you did. You'll never lose it because he created it and gave it to you. So this front loads many of the books of the New Testament. Grace and peace to you from God. Isn't that important? Yeah, it is to me. But not James. Greetings. Isn't that nice? James has, over the centuries since, many times been referred to as a sort of Old Testament prophet holdover, steeped in Proverbs and the Sermon on the Mount, who somehow came to believe that his brother, uh, Jesus, was the Messiah, the anointed one he and others had been waiting for. But we know, fast forward from that day to this, that James has an edge about him. When years ago, I first read the book of James, no kidding, I had nightmares. I had nightmares. In one of my nightmares that I still remember to this day, sadly, um, I was with kind of a crowd of people, it was a beautiful field, and some of them were launching up into the air. What was happening? This rapture that I was learning about, this thing about the, the church was going to be caught up in the air to meet the Lord. What happened to me? I didn't go anywhere. I stayed on the ground. And I still remember kind of, uh, is there a jump you got to do? I'm not kidding. And I had this sort of, oh, no. And I got left. And I woke up with that because I'd been reading the book of James. And I knew I was violating everything. Everything was wrong about me. Oh, no. It must be that I'm in trouble and I'm not going to make it. 
See, until that point, most everything I had discovered in Christianity was that I was finally free of what had mastered me and what I had once been. I was free of all that that was and free in something else. I'd been crucified with Christ. I had died to sin. I had been raised in Christ alive to God. I was new, I was free, and life by the Spirit in me was the adventure of my days. Yay! This is great! And then what did I do? Greetings. I read James. Many people I have found over the many years since avoid Brother James for similar reasons. He's mad. He's got an edge. It's a downer. It's a bummer. <clears throat> and that because they find, they've, or they've found, and they love what the Apostle Paul writes to, for example, the Galatian church in chapter 5, verse 1. It's on the screen. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Well, that sounds important. He uses the word twice. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. This word freedom, we'll see it again in a little bit, means without restraint. I have found to this day that many in the church think that God comes with a straight jacket of sorts, a, a, a jacket of restraint. That's not according to the gospel. It's without restraint. So great and new is your new birth as a son of God, he wants you unrestrained. You're released, you're new, and you're free. And this yoke of slavery means living by trying to keep the law or living by rule-keeping, life by rule-keeping, instead of life by Christ and by faith in Him and by the Spirit of God. You try something else. How many of you know how that something else goes? It doesn't work because it isn't designed for you. Jewish fake believers had snuck in amongst the Galatian believers and introduced rule-keeping as a way of earning from God what He had already given them for free in total, and what He would always give them because of who He was and where He had put them in Christ, who has all things. All this was the grace of God, and they knew it, but these fake Jewish believers had snuck in and said, you know, that's good, but it could be gooder. You might have lost some of the all that you never earned. Here's how to get it back. And if you believe it, that's how religious slaves are made. You've got to get what God already gave. It's a trap. And so Paul says to the Galatian Christians, don't go for that. He says in chapter 2, you'll see it on the screen, verse 4, this matter, the matter was this attempt at rule keeping, arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Freedom was their target because freedom was their prized possession. This is also how freedom is challenged today. But the Holy Spirit, fortunately for us, is determined to keep you and me free at all times. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, you'll see it on the screen. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's what? Say it. Yeah. So, I, I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people who get nervous thinking about the Holy Spirit's going to visit them. Holy Spirit's going to visit you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Uh, oh, he's the weirdo. He's the loose cannon of the Trinity, kind of. What's he going to do? That. That. It'll be all about freedom with you. Always freedom. That's his ministry. But Brother James, what made a terrific difference for me in reading James was a little verse in this first chapter and I hope starting today and going forward, it makes a great difference for you too. James chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 25. 
But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And I remember thinking, oh, James, Jimmy, Jacob, you've got another take on freedom. That's what you're talking about. You've got another, another aspect of liberty on life after your death with Christ and your rebirth in Him. You have another way of talking about liberty, about freedom. Oh, well, then I want to know because it's part of what I am. Part of what I have is this. And he says that the way of freedom, something his Jewish contemporaries were evidently abandoning to their own peril, means three things. Number one, you'll see it on the screen. Keep looking. Keep looking into my freedom in Christ. Some of us know how good it is, and we just all we want to know about is, what happened again? What do I have? Where am I in Christ? How good is this? He's telling you, do this. Look into it. Keep looking into it. So this is a prime reason that we gather together as much as we can, whether it's in person or online. This is why we do it, to encourage each other in freedom, to encourage each other in all that we've been given by grace, so that we may know and enjoy this new life that God is determined to give us and is determined we should stay and remain in. That's the hallmark of Christianity, freedom in Christ all the time. Freedom in Christ works us in the same way that a perfect law runs your car after you put fuel into it, well, most of our cars. Grace and who you are and what you have in your heart now, grace works freedom in you. And you know how, how much better you feel after reading, after singing, after praying. And God has sort of done that, hey, I'm in here again, remember? You forgot. I'm working freedom. Don't you feel better? And you do. It's not because he's giving you freedom. It's because you have freedom. He's just proving it. That's this great law of freedom. And then he says a second thing that we're to do. Remember. Remember my freedom. And I would say, what, and what we're doing this morning, remember it for each other. Remember it for yourself and remember it for each other and serve it to each other. Remember it for those who don't yet know it. Tell them that the, the appeal of Christianity is not rules. It's not rule keeping. It's not getting your life right. It's freedom. Freedom and life. And the third thing he says, do my freedom. I don't think that's a good sentence. Anybody else? Bear with me. Do my freedom. In other words, walk in it. Walk out what he has worked in. Take the steps of who you are and what you have and what you're like now and who you're like now. Does that make sense? Walk in it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, you'll, 12, you'll see it on the screen. Continue to do what? Continue to work out. Work out. Don't work for. Can't do that. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who does what? It's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This, he's going to give you these urgings in keeping with who you are and where he is inside of you, and he's going to work this out. The reason there's fear and trembling involved, it's pretty much like this. This is amazing. Oh my gosh. It's like that, if I could sum up with a, a, a picture. So work it out. And this is the heart of the gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ, and he will remove from you your dark and troubled core, your heart of stone, and he'll give you a new heart, a new one, 
like His, in which He lives in perfect union with you, His newborn Son, His born all over again daughter, free from darkness, free from sin, free to live in faith that it is all true. Not to earn it, but to live in faith that it worked. It's true. And James' target audience had lost touch with their own hearts of freedom. And of course, they were acting like it. Have you ever done that? Have you ever f- forgotten who you are and how well off you are with God? What happened? Did it go well? Anybody? <clears throat> no. Well, that's what's happening to these Jewish believers. So James was calling them back to the freedom of doing in keeping with their freedom and new life in Christ. Match them up. Put them together. That's how this all works. You got the first two, get the third. In other words, you've been freed. Now walk in keeping with your freedom. So you know that biblically speaking, freedom doesn't mean uh, nothing. It means something great. And the one who keeps you free leads you in that freedom. So you're never restrained, never incarcerated, never in darkness again. In the fourth chapter, James concludes that, and we saw this last week, with sort of needling and waking up believers who were missing out on knowing God by looking into the freedom he'd given them, by remembering and sharing it with others, and by doing their freedom Because they'd given themselves to doing something else, strategizing everything in their days as though life could come from out there instead of in here. They were over-strategizing everything. And in chapter 5, James, see we got there, in chapter 5, James gets after those who had forsaken their freedom, the reality of that, by giving in to the temptation to hoard wealth and abuse people in doing it. In James chapter 5, verse 1, you'll see it on the screen. So listen. Hey, listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that's coming upon you. Your wealth is rotted. And moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver, they're corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Tell me he doesn't sound like an Old Testament prophet. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields, they're crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts, which means the Lord of armies. That's a different take on it, isn't it? Verse 5, you have lived for pleasure on the earth and lived luxuriously. You've not lived for knowing God. You live for something else. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not even opposing you. How ugly is that picture? How crazy is that? And how crazy have the Jewish believers gone? And their behavior was revealing the crazy. Does that make sense? What they were doing revealed the problem. They'd lost. They'd traded away the freedom of of who they are in Christ for something else. And these Jewish believers likely knew the Old Testament truth of Proverbs chapter 10, verse 3. You'll see it on the screen. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. They likely knew that. These were Jewish believers. They were familiar with the Old Testament. James obviously knew it. Further, James likely knew what his brother Jesus said. Matthew chapter chapter 6, rather, verse 26 Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or stow away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? What would the answer be? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. I think probably that's right. In other words, what are you doing? 
You've lost your minds. Come back to the freedom you have in Christ, and then you'll act like it. It's cost you your freedom, and it's costing everybody around you. Pay attention. That's what he's saying. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. That's what was happening. Verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Here's the picture. Stab, 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 stab. I've lost my freedom. I've forgotten my freedom. I'm not remembering my freedom. And I'm stabbing myself and, in effect, stabbing others because I've forgotten it and I'm walking and living like it. Somebody help me. And that's what James is doing. And by the way, what does money give you? What do you get from money? Well, Food and shelter, for sure. But money offers an identity that is other than. It's another kind of identity. You can be styling. You can be collecting. You can be doing all kinds of things, getting an identity because of money. It'll be foreign to you. It'll be twisted. It'll be worldly. But it will give you an identity, a style point that somehow in your fleshly thinking is, yeah, that's what I want. But it's against you, and to the degree it is against you is always the degree to which you'll suffer. It'll hurt you, and you'll end up causing hurt to others. Besides that identity, whatever this world offers you, it can never match up with your heaven-born identity. I mentioned it in the prayer this morning uh, before we started here. Your nobility, your royalty. True, it's, it's invisible. But does that make it less true? No, it's the truth of who you are. Heaven born nobility, royalty in this world. And God loves to reveal it to you all the time so that knowing it, you'll act from that truth in the world. That's freedom. James chapter 5, verse 7. You'll see it on the screen. He says, okay, be patient. Now let me just give you a little side note. What do we know from Galatians chapter 5 about patience? Is it something that you're supposed to cook up and have? Is it? No. It's not a demand on you It's an offer of a gift of the Holy Spirit because a fruit of the Spirit, a production of the Spirit, where's the Spirit in in believers? Inside. One of His things He loves to produce is the evidence of His presence in you. We know that as a gift, an evidence. Here you go. And one of those is patience. Here's James calling him back. Remember this? You got everything. Why are you... Look... Be patient is not a command for you to do it. It's, a, it's a, like a command to awaken. Have patience is, better, is a better way to say it. Have it. Don't cook it up. Remember that you have it. So have it. Enjoy it. It's free. It's a gift. So be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains, you too be patient and do what? Stand firm. Stand firm in your freedom. Stand firm in what you have and who you are because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, the word judge here, just just to make sure you understand, means to choose out to estimate, to weigh an incident, and to judge it fair or foul, one or the other. This isn't a judgment to eternal condemnation to Jewish believers, since we know, the verse you'll see on the screen above me, Romans chapter 5, verse 9, 
Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath from him? Anybody have a hooray? Yeah. Yay. Don't want anything to do with that. You won't have anything to do with that if you're in Christ. Romans chapter 8, you'll see that on the screen. Verse 1, therefore, there is how much condemnation for any of us in Christ? What? Are you sure? Do you hear condemnation in your head sometimes nevertheless? I do. Yeah, but then I have to, wait, 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 wait. There's a moment I've lost my freedom or my freedom's in jeopardy. It feels like it's in jeopardy. I'm going back to remembering what I have because of Jesus. Oh, yeah, no condemnation. It's because I've been justified already. There's nothing to condemn. Ah, yeah, that's good. I'm free, actually. So shut up, head, Whatever that, wherever that came from. Therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Anybody amen? Yeah. That's good news. And that's what he's telling the Jewish believers. Remember. James chapter 5, you'll see it on the screen. Verse 10. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets, here he goes, <laughs> take the guys I remember best, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance, same word, and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So the question is this, why did those he's talking about, why did they persevere? Not for, not for, for perseverance sake, but because they believed. Don't you do that? Yes, they were believers. Well, so are we. So we've come back to believing, which induces you to do what? Keep going. Persevere. You can do this. God doesn't get his thrills out of us persevering. I'm going to keep going. It's all I know to do. Oh, I love it when they look like that. That's not it. It's, yeah, they, they know. They know I'm with them. They know I'm ahead of them, before them. I'm bringing them into good works they don't even know about, but I do. And I'm bringing them, and they'll be ready. And they're thinking about it. And they're persevering because they're thinking about it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why they persevered. In other words, keep your heart of freedom with God by remembering what he has done for you and to you and by walking in it. Do your freedom. Do it. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, a brilliant and I think a fortunately concise and unusual, uh, unusually concise way from Paul, way for Christians to live in freedom and faith by doing something because of the first two, freedom and faith. Romans chapter 6, Paul writes this, in the same way, as Jesus did, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires, meaning not yours. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under law. What are you under? Grace. All through this is think about this. You were crucified with Christ. You were raised in him holy and new. You have a whole new way of living. You are righteous. So offer yourselves to God. Where was God in these believers? In them. They weren't, they weren't offering to perform something out here. They were offering themselves in union with God on the inside who keeps them free in the works they're to do. I think, I pray like this, Lord, I'm glad you're here with me. I'm glad, and I'm offering myself to you because we're together, you and I, and you're right here with me. You'll never forsake me, never leave me. You're not just around me and ahead of me. You're that too. But you're also in me. That's Christianity. So I'm offering myself to you, and I'm offering my body 
today, it's my eyes and mostly my mouth, to you for your good purposes, because I know that'll mean righteousness, and that's what I'm all about. I've been all about that since my new birth in Christ. James chapter 5, verse 12. <clears throat> Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. Now, this swear, by the way, means to take an oath. It means taking an oath, um, o- taking oaths that promise faith and obedience to something. And James is saying, you don't live like that. That's not you. That's what people do on diets. But I haven't put you on a Christian diet. There aren't any. You have everything with me, so don't live like that. Instead, and the reason you don't is because you end up losing freedom when you do that. And you instead suffer the penalty of self-scrutiny and measurement. Anybody notice how, how that works? I promise I will, and I promise I won't. What happens? Your focus quickly gets off of God, who's given you all things, and who lives in you, and it becomes on a way of measuring yourself out there. How am I doing? How's it going? And what invariably happens? Failure. And then you, you come under this false guilt that God never assault, uh, assigned to you. I almost said assaulted, but that's kind of true too. He never gave you that, but you start feeling like, oh gosh, I must be guilty. I, bro- I broke my oath. I broke my promise. And that's, James is saying, don't do it. Keep it simple or people will judge you. People will judge you by the oaths and promises you make and break. And then James calls them to refocus upon Jesus and life from him. And before we read, start reading in chapter 5, verse 13, I want you to think about when you do some of the things that James tells his Jewish believers to do, what happens to you? What, what's implicit in each of these things that James tells his readers, and now us, to do? James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. What's, what's going to happen to you if you do either one of those things? It's not just the result of, the, of praying or of singing songs. It's that you're turning your thoughts where? To Jesus. To God. And the freedom He has with you. And then that connection... You know how this goes. I think I mentioned this a while back, but sometimes you come into a, a worship uh, like we've had here this morning. You come into that, and do you ever feel like, I am so not ready to worship? I'm keeping my arms locked. I'm not moving today in Jesus' name. And you just have this, Ugh. and you feel like that, and you, I know I shouldn't, so I'll look pleasant. You know, and you have this thing that goes on in you. And then they start playing music, and you start going, okay, yeah, that, you know, sounded pretty good. And then they start singing, and pretty soon you got like this tap maybe. And then maybe like a, oh, okay, I hate it. Here we go. Oh, great. And you start, you end up singing. And how do you end up? Feeling better. Why? Freedom! And he's revealing it to you and in you. He starts working you because you're his vessel. He's in you, and he's working for his own glory by reviving you and bringing you to faith and bringing faith to you. Does that make sense? You've experienced this, and that's what happens when you pray. As you, you, soon as you start praying, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, anything, you're turning your thoughts toward him who has given you what? Freedom and life. And that's what he's telling them to do. They're going to benefit if they do this. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. If they're sinners, they're going to get forgiven of their sin right then. Hallelujah. Verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Isn't that good? That's great. If I've offended you, if I've done something, let's get together, and our relationship gets healed. I feel better. You feel better. 
And then he says this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crop. Look back at verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Anybody like that part? Anybody attracted to that part? Anybody feel burdened by that part? Like, ugh, ugh. Not sure I qualify for that. Here's the pop quiz of the morning. You'll see it on the screen. How many righteous people are here or are watching today? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. I'm so glad that some of us didn't raise our hands. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, fine. Some of you Sharpies raised yours. That's fine. Good. Okay, you're right. But for those of us who don't raise our hands, why don't we do it? It's always because we think something like this. I have not behaved righteously. I haven't done it right. I am therefore disqualified. Not, I'm not with Elijah. No way. But what do we know is true about righteousness? If you have believed in Jesus Christ, in his death and resurrection, then not only do you have the gift of righteousness, but you have become righteous. You. You didn't choose it. You didn't earn it. He gave it and made it happen. Let's look on the screen. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man... Death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace, nobody goes, oh, I love grace, and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. How many have, have received the gift of righteousness? Whether you know it or not, you get it? Yes, because he gave it. He didn't leave it up to you. He gave it to you, and you have it. It's just that we don't appreciate it because we're always working and, and focused on our own. I know. I know how this goes. And so God brings me back to, hey, righteous man, you're good. Remember, I gave it to you. I made it happen. And that is good news. We never have to earn it, and we never lose it because he gave it to us so that something else could happen. And that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who knew no sin, who had no sin, to be sin for us, and here we go, so that in him we might become what? Come on, read with me. The righteousness of God. How many have become? Anybody? Anybody want to raise your hand now who didn't a moment ago? Yeah. Was it your fault? Did you earn it? Can you lose it? No, it's true. You've become something. And that's why it's important that we believe the truth so that when God says, hey, do righteously, we go, oh yeah, because I am righteous. That's how I live. That's where my freedom is, is in living as I have been gifted and become. I've received the very righteousness of Christ, and now I've been made righteous, and I'm going to walk in it. Come on, that's good news. It comes together, doesn't it? So when he says, behave like this, not that, because that's crazy. You're not crazy. Come back to your minds. Come back to your right mind. Think about this. Live by faith and walk in righteousness. Amen? Yeah. James chapter 5, verse 19. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, verse 20, Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Well, if anyone has wandered from the truth, here is your time. Today is your time to wander back to the truth. Ah, I'm so glad for the truth. That's a good wander, isn't it? 
to reclaim your freedom and to walk in it is the best thing you've got. And if you're recognizing the error of your way and believing in Jesus for the first time, welcome, welcome. Jesus forgives you your sin, removes it forever, forever, and makes you new and walks with you into your new life and freedom. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, it's the greatest news. It's the greatest news. And it's not just something that appeals to our heads, though it does. It appeals to our hearts. That place where you set up your home and dwell in us. And it's just, there are times we have where it's almost as if you're shouting, it's true. Know this, my sons and daughters. Know this. And for those who have not yet received you, you're saying nonetheless, know this. And then they find themselves believing and receiving and their hearts are changed too. And you work by grace through faith in us and then through us. And we have freedom and we remember freedom and we remember it for each other and share it with each other and then we do freedom. We walk in freedom What you have worked in, we then work out. That is so freeing and encouraging. And we thank you for Jacob and James all those centuries ago for his take on walking in freedom so we keep our hearts of freedom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.